Hi, uh, today we're really lucky enough to be joined by Tim Bailey, who's one of the top sports lawyers, um, was also one of the leading individual sports lawyers in the country, um, voted recently. So I hope you enjoy a bit of a unique look into the sports law industry. Thank you. Tim, thanks for joining us. How are you keeping? Morning, Darren. I'm very well, thank you. Enjoying the sunshine down here in the Cotswolds, um, waiting to take the dog out for a walk. But I'll put that back for a few moments so I can talk to you. Thank you. We're very honoured. <laughs> it's great for joining us. We're going to have a chat about sports law today. Um, obviously, you know, you're, you're one of the most experienced sports lawyers around. And it'd just be great if you could give us an insight in, into the sports law business. So to start with, what, what exactly is sports law? And, and you tell us what it's like to be a sports lawyer. I certainly can, yeah. Um, there's, there's actually no such thing as sports law in itself. Um, sports law is a term which is generally used to describe uh, a number of legal principles that can be applied to sport so it's the law which relates to people participating in the sport itself um, organizations that are involved in sport whether that be a club or a league or or a business sponsoring uh, a club or an individual and it's all of the different legal principles that apply to those relationships so it includes for example contract law which is clearly fundamental to any uh, to any um, situation, relationship in sport, um, it would include uh, intellectual property. So it will cover things such as trademarks, um, uh, image rights and such like. It will cover um, what's called the law of tort, which deals with negligence. So it can cover um, injuries that you might sustain whilst playing sport. So it's a whole range of different legal principles which can be applied to uh, any sort of sporting relationship. Sure, okay, and, and which sports, you know, obviously you, you, you're well known for your football cricket work, which other sports have you, do you work in and, and also which sort of countries has it taken you around the globe to work in? Yeah, I've been very fortunate over the years, I've been doing this now for about 15 or so years, it's given me the opportunity to look at a whole different range of sports um, from the perspective of a lawyer aside, as you say, from you know, main sports, football, cricket, and rugby. Um, I've been involved with um, cycling. I've advised um, a few years back, uh, uh, one of our Olympic GB cyclists. Um, I've worked with athletes, um, sprinters, hurdlers. Um, and quite recently, I was advising um, one of our gold medalist kayakers in relation to a recent decision which um, has been made by the governing body for that sport in relation to what they were going to do with regard to selection of the team for the postponed Olympics um, for next year. Because obviously, they'd selected a team to compete this year. Uh, so they had to decide what they were going to do because the, the games have been delayed for the first year. Do they stick with the same team or do they go through the, the, the qualifying process again for next year? Um, so there, there's been a whole different range of sports that I've, I've been called upon to advise on, in usually in relation to contractual matters. Um, and the, the practice, my practice, tends to be um, very much international, sports global, uh, particularly football and cricket. Um, so I get to be involved in a lot of different issues relating to um, sport in, for example, in the US with soccer. We do a lot of work out there, working with um, Inter Miami at the moment on various documents that they're going to need players under option from different countries and so on um, regulatory work in football um, obviously FIFA governed football on a world basis but obviously those regulations apply and are adopted differently in, in, in other countries but they are the same for example uh, in the US they've now recently uh, decided to adopt the system of training compensation so that will put a different slant on, on how they deal with development of players and so on. Um, 
as you know, you and I have worked in cricket and we've been to many countries. Um, the one that springs to mind is our trip to Zimbabwe, which was great fun, where we were advising the guys there on uh, <laughs> recruiting players for their um, their Premier League. Um, very enjoyable trip. So, you know, I've travelled to many places recently, to China two or three times, um, to look at um, how we could work with the Chinese in relation to some football deals. Um, Europe, all around Europe with football um, and cricket, obviously, you and I have been to, to, to various countries working on um, deals in, in cricket. So, yeah, I've been very fortunate. It's been great. Fantastic, fantastic. And um, just, just moving on to a bit of a more solemn tone, um, coronavirus, obviously massive effect around the world. But what can we expect to see? What effects can we expect to see for the sport? I think, yeah, I think... <laughs> It's obviously been so difficult for everybody involved. Um, I've been very busy over the, the, the last couple of months or so, um, largely advising players um, on the effect of COVID in relation to their, uh, their employment. Um, you, we, we've all read about clubs furloughing players. We've read about clubs wanting um, players to take decrease in salary and deferring salary payments and so on. So. Um, I've had a lot of engagement with players and, and a few clubs over how all of that needs to be dealt with. Um, it's going to take a long time to um, adjust, get back to what we all feel is, is, is normality uh, and sport's no different. I mean, COVID has put a stop virtually on a global basis to, to, to every sport. Um, and it's a question of how each sport in each country um, apply themselves in the way, in the right way to try and, uh, and, and recover what we have before. Um, I, I think largely um, we've done a reasonable job here. Um, I'm talking about, um, in particular, I'm talking about football. That's where I've had most experience over the last couple of months. I think... I think both the uh, the Premier League, the EFL and the FA have actually worked quite well um, together in, in an effort to try and come up with a solution, um, which means that, 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 first of all, football can, can restart. Uh, but what, what's most important to me is the way uh, we deal with player welfare, because clearly bringing football back too quickly without proper safety measures, precautions in place would have been a disaster. And I think the government have, have worked well and worked closely with, with many sports to try and come up with a protocol which makes it as safe as possible for players to restart training and then uh, restart competitive uh, sport. So I think in that regard, I think the, the, the leagues, the governing bodies and the government have, have so far um, worked very hard and have come up with what appears to be now um, a protocol which is as safe as it can be in the circumstances. Yeah. Um, one of the big problems, obviously, is, is the financial position that, that sport's now in. Um, I think the Premier League um, are fortunate and I think there, there is so much money available at, at that level that I don't think we're going to see Premier League club, clubs suffer too badly yeah. uh, but it's those at the other end of the pyramid that are going to suffer you know the the, the, the National League teams, League, League One, League Two teams um, with absolutely no revenues coming in uh, it's extremely difficult because somebody has got to keep the club going and unless you've got uh, a generous, wealthy um, owner, then it's going to be very difficult to, to survive. And I think we are going to see towards the end of this year, early next year, clubs actually going out of business. It's yeah. inevitable. Yeah, you really yeah. think that's an almost certainty, do you? Uh, I do, I do. Um, uh, I've been doing some work with a, with a firm of accountants recently on um, some football finance issues that they wanted me to um, uh, advise on and it's quite clear that um, you know looking at some of the financial financial information that's now coming out 
um, from, from clubs, it's going to be really difficult for a lot of them to survive. Mm. And I think it needs, it, it, in, in a way, it, it, it will enable us to start again in many ways in terms of how football is financed. There needs to be a lot more financial support and assistance from the top level, from the Premier League. Uh, there isn't enough. Um, and the gulf is getting larger and larger. Um, uh, and that's always going to be a problem. That's always going to be a problem. I don't know how we solve that. Yeah. We look at the championship, you know, they're, on average, they're spending over 100% of their revenue on salary. It's not a sustainable business. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully, like I say, it'll, it'll introduce some positive change. To just going back to the law side of things, so you know, you, you, your main parts of your job are sort of contracts, commercial, regulation, regulatory work. Which is the most interesting to you? Um, I, I find uh, I find the commercial side of sport the most interesting. Um, I enjoy the um, the involvement with businesses that are looking. To become involved in sport whether that's a sponsors um, or investors um, that side of it appeals to me i work with a lot of players and a lot of clubs on commercial contracts of all kinds um, one of the things i enjoy doing um, is image rights structures for for, for the higher profile players um, looking at how they can maximize revenue from their quote celebrity if you like um, so advising in that area gives me um, gives me a real buzz. Great. Okay. And Tim, again, you, you've advised many Premier League clubs on multi-million pound deals. You know, cricket. You know, some of the top cricket clubs, counties around the world. How does it feel when you have to take on uh, perhaps a major team or a, a, like or the FA or something? You know, with a perhaps a player compensation deal or a selection issue. How does that feel for you? You know, you've, big, you've always been a big sports fan yourself. Does it yeah. feel a bit odd when you're perhaps going up against <laughs> someone you've, you've admired or you've grown up an aura of a little bit as a young lad? It, it's, that's, that's the most exciting part of the job. But what you, what you have to do first and foremost is put all of that aside. Yeah, as a, as a, as a football fan, you know, you, you probably... Most people would be awestruck, but you can't be like that. You know, you have to disengage from your um, your love of sport, and in particular that team, and just deal with the job in hand. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, I've been involved recently where I've been advising on training compensation issues between Premier League clubs. So one club will... will He'll, he'll sign a young player once his, his registration's expired. So we have the other club then claiming compensation. They, if they can't reach a deal on how much should be paid, then you have to go before an independent panel, which is made up by um, uh, the FA. So you have, a, you have a, a chairman who's legally qualified, then you have people from each of the leagues and the FA and so on. And you have to go and argue the case on behalf of whichever club you're, you're working for as to how much... Um, the compensation should be so those, those are quite interesting because you know you, you're 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 working for a particular club so you're you're fighting everybody else because you want to do the best job for that club uh, and whether it get the price whether it be get the price down or get the price up depends on which side you're on uh, but that sort of stuff's good yeah yeah okay here's, um, a little, here's a little cheeky scenario for you tim we'll go back a few years you walk into the office of uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. He's trying to sign, uh, trying to sign, you know, a player, Eric Cantona, who I think might be one of your favourites. Well, don't say that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but you, you, you've got, you've got to come in and investigate. You know, whether the, the regulations are right, and you potentially you could stop that deal going ahead by doing what's right. So Alex, just pulls you to one side and says, "Come on, Tim." Do us a favour. What, <laughs> what do you do? What do you do? Oh, the, what are what are the worst situations I think I could find myself <laughs> in it, if if I can imagine having to advise Sir Alex Ferguson? I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to sign this player. The regulations say this, and we can't comply. Um, oh, that would be my worst nightmare. That. But Just think if that had happened. <laughs> 
Where, where would United be now without Eric Cantona? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a good, good moral judgment for you there, mate. Yeah, yeah. No, you've just got to do your job. You've got to do your job. Of course, yeah. So I won't give you any more questions like that, don't worry. <laughs> And uh, just get on to sort of national uh, governing bodies, international and national. Do you think it was too much interference? Or yeah, and it, it was obviously quite difficult recently when the like the transfer windows for FIFA were, de- you know, were, you could say worked against the Premier League um, as they were different. But but what's your general sort of um, what's your take on the governing bodies and you know how they operate generally? I, I think I think in many respects they're a necessary evil. Um, somebody has to um, legislate, if you like, as to how uh, the particular sport is going to operate, and it, it it will have to be in a lot of sports on a global basis, as we've seen with FIFA, we see with the ICC. You have to govern everybody. Um, what important point to bear in mind is it doesn't matter what an international sporting governing body uh, may say in terms of regulation, that regulation can never usurp the domestic law. Mm. Um, So if a regulation affecting any sport here, whether it's cricket or football, is contrary to our own laws, it can't be enforced. So when we look at the, the COVID situation, our employment laws here basically say that an employer cannot force an employee to take a reduction in salary. Um, They can't force the employee to to, to sign an extension to a contract, for example. Now, we saw recently FIFA guidelines when COVID came in as to how they wanted to try and deal with the the situation with player contracts on a global basis. Absolutely impossible. They recognised that. And they said, look, these are our suggestions, but they are only suggestions. Because if domestic law doesn't allow that particular uh, course to take to be taken, then you can't you can't implement it. So, is there too much involvement? I think I think there there, there probably in certain areas is too much involvement. Um, yeah. But we do need to have somebody at the top who is actually governing the sport. Um, FIFA, the, the, uh, the, the constitution of FIFA as world governing body, um, basically means that whatever regulations FIFA make have to be adopted by each of the individual member associations. So if we look at the, the FIFA training compensation regulations, they have to be adopted by the FA in relation to any transfers which take place on an international basis. Mm. So if a player moves from England to France, the FIFA regulations apply. They don't apply if that player moves domestically between clubs here. We have our own training compensation regulations. So is there too much involvement? I don't think, I don't think there is. I think it's, it, it's necessary. It's necessary yeah. because of the global nature of sport. You have to have a body like FIFA or the ICC to govern. Yeah. And to just moving on to um, into on to, to sports management, sports agency. Obviously, you you mm. help to sports management. Um, and with regards to agents, and, and going back to the, the regulation from FIFA and, and that sort of thing. So obviously, um, with a big change in the agents, when you know, used to pass an exam, then it would be called pretty much free for all. You know, what, what is your general, you know, what's your general view of agents in, in terms of, well, one, you know, was it a good thing to make it free for all? Um, yeah, and, and what, you know, what, what do you see as a role for good or for ill from a, a sports <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, uh, regulation of agents. Um, if you look at the regulation of agents in football and where we sit at the moment, Uh, If I take you back to April 2015, prior to that date, we had a system of of licensing Mm -hmm. of football agents, which again was a a FIFA regulation, which national associations had to adopt. Um, And that required you as an individual to pass an exam um, and to provide evidence of professional. You do, you do. (laughs) Um, That for me, 
enabled um, football to regulate and ensure that people wanting to become football agents had some knowledge of the legal situation regarding players employment and representation um, and the regulatory side um, since 2015 when licensing of football agents was effectively done away with we have very little regulation what's come in its place um, is the registration of intermediaries now if you want to become an intermediary in football then you sign a declaration saying you have a clean criminal record and you've not been bankrupt and such like. Yeah? You pay £500 plus VAT to the FA and off you go. So we, we've seen over the last five years, in 2015 we had about 700 odd registered licensed football agents. We now have between three and 4,000 registered intermediaries operating in yeah. the UK which creates a, a ridiculously crowded marketplace. When you look at the number of registered professional footballers, there's not many more footballers registered as professionals than there are intermediaries. Yeah. And there's a, it's, it's allowed a lot of people into the business who have no idea, have no experience, no education, don't understand the regulations. Um, so it's become a free-for-all. Uh, it's, it's the Wild West. It's been described as that by, by many people. What we now have are proposed FIFA reforms, which will effectively take us back to where we were in 2015. But what they've also sought to try and do is cap the amount of commission. Now that, in my view, if it's challenged legally here, is bound to fail. Um, I do not see... Um, that that type of restriction on somebody's ability to earn a living would be upheld by the courts here. Really, really. And, yeah. and how would you feel personally, obviously, we're not many particular deals where, where sort of agents have taken literally millions out of a deal, uh, presumably more than what you would, would be the usual percentage. How do you feel? I, I think, you know, that they're, they're, the, they're the only deals that you read about. Yeah. They're the ones that sell newspapers. You don't read about the agent that's moved a lad from Mansfield to Macclesfield and has earned five hundred pounds. There are some obscene amounts of money being paid in football, not just to agents but to players. Yeah. And and the more money the players earn, the more the agents will earn. Um, the higher the transfer fee, the more money the agents earn. So it's inevitable with the with the, the growth in, in the value of, of, of transfers and the player wage demands that they'll earn more. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, it, it's down to the clubs. It's a, it's a negotiation. You know, if the agent's saying, this is, this is my fee, uh, and the club are desperate for the player, then they will find a way of paying it. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I, I, I don't like the fact that there is so much money effectively going out of the game, but players need representation. Yeah. You cannot do away with agents. Um, the unfortunate thing is there are a lot of people out there now who are nowhere near knowledgeable enough, experienced enough, or honest enough to do a good job for a player. Yeah, yeah. Great, Tim. Tim just moving on to, um, also, you, you, you know, well, for a while you've been doing lecturing at, um, at quite a few different universities, colleges. So just tell us a little bit about that and, and what, um, what sort of advice you give, you know, it's a question I get asked a lot, um, be interesting from your point of view, what advice you would give to someone who wants to get into sport? I think what we've, what we've found over the last few years is that um, there are, are more and more opportunities for young people to actually study something which is relevant to what they want to do. Now, I do a lot of work uh, as a guest lecturer for um, UCFB, University College of Football Business in uh, Wembley and Manchester. Um, and they run a whole range of different courses for young people that want to become involved in sport, uh, football, cricket, rugby, whatever it is, in, in, in different roles. Um, non, I'm talking now about non-playing 
yeah. role. So whether that's involved with marketing, football finance, media, uh, they run a whole range of different courses to um, equip students to find a job in sport. So that's a great thing. Um, so my advice to anybody wanting to uh, to become involved in sport is find a course. You know, if if it's coaching, then there are plenty of coaching courses out there. If it's if it's um, if it's commerce, if it's um, administration work you want to do, find a course. There's loads out there. Um, so my advice is education is key at the moment, and I'm very keen to pass on my knowledge, my experience to people that are going to take over from 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 me at some point. So education is key. Excellent, excellent. Tim, thanks. It's been fantastic, really enlightening. Um, great to see to see how you work and your thoughts and, and advice on the industry. So thanks for joining us. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Darren. I hope to see you soon. I'm now going to walk the dog. Okay. See you <laughs> yeah. later. Apologies again for that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Tim. See you. See you. Bye. Bye. I know. hope you enjoyed that uh, really enlightening chat with Tim. It was really good to get a good insight into the sports law industry. Uh, Tim's also very kindly said if anyone wants to um, send any questions over to us that we'd like to know about the sports law, um, any specific questions, Tim, happy to do a, come back and answer a few questions, basically. So if you've got anything, please feel free to fire it through to us. And uh, don't forget to... Hit the subscribe button and catch up with our next installment of the Vitae Sports YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. Bye.